Amen. As Sean said, we're still in the book of Judges. How many have been enjoying the book of Judges? <laughs> All right, a good number of you. And so as we've been going through the book of Judges, um, it's really been interesting. Um, you know, I've read the book of Judges, I, I can't even tell you how many times. Um, I've been saved for almost 50 years, so I read through the Bible every year, so I've done it at least 50 times that I know of. Um, but it's an interesting book because they keep blowing it. God gives them so many chances. He, he shows his power to them. He reveals who he is. And as soon as one of the good judges dies, guess what happens? They fall back. They fall back into their evil ways. And they have a history of that. And now we get to the judge called Samson. And I call Samson the foolish judge. And when you think about all that the book of Proverbs has to say about a fool, Samson fulfills that portion of scripture perfectly. He wasn't a fool for Christ. He was a fool for the devil, really, when you think about it. And so, you know, the, Israel went through a lot of difficulties, and then God would come and preserve them. In all of this, they're trying to inherit the land that God promised Abraham. And after Joshua, they had pretty much inherited a lot of the land, but God left some of the land open so that future generations could be tested. And that's what we happen, see happening during the book of Judges, the nation of Israel being tested. Are they gonna follow through with the promise that God gave them and fulfill his word. And on many occasions, we see that did not happen. And the sad thing about Samson is this, is that he was given extraordinary power, more than any of the other judges. And he could have used his power to really conquer all the land that was given to the nation of Israel. But he really didn't conquer that much. I mean, God had his way in the midst of some of that and allowed a lot of the Philistines to eat the dust. But it's important to understand that their experiences were really written for our admonition. How many believe that? It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, now all these things happened to them as examples. And they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. And we're, so, so in other words, we're supposed to look at what happened there and see what not to do. <laughs> and rather see what God's intended purposes are for our lives. And then it says, therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. That's the admonition to us. Let's look at what happened to all of these judges. Let's look what happened to the life of Samson and take heed lest we fall. Just as there were many, many deceiving voices in that day, there was a culture in that day that was stuck in the mire. And that's a culture that Samson grew up in. And so as we look to God's word today, we will be looking at the life of Samson, who was given this extraordinary power to lead Israel away from their captivity. And so I've titled this message, Samson, the Foolish Judge, because of how he misused and abused the extraordinary power that God had given to him. 
But to be somewhat fair, I would say he was pretty much a victim of his culture to what the Israelites of that day found themselves in. It was a compromised culture. It was a culture, as we have seen, everybody doing what is right in their own eyes. They had been so steeped in that kind of a mentality that they had forgotten what the law of Moses had instructed them. They had been carried away to a place of compromise, no longer believing in the reality of God's word to the point that they were following the idols of the day. One biblical scholar writes, like the rest of his compatriots, Samson was a typical Israelite operating exclusively on the basis of his senses. I mean, how many of us even today operate out of our natural senses versus the divine nature of God that's to be a part of our lives? And when we constantly are operating out of our own sufficiency, our own reasoning, we have, you know, here's the deal. We grew up today in a culture that is just as compromised as Samson's culture was. And, and a lot of that stuff is ingrained into our mentality. It's ingrained into the way we operate and do things. And as a result, the Word of God has a hard time getting through all that. And so we have to come to a place where we say, okay, <laughs> I realize a lot of the things that were ingrained to me as a child. You know, the, the things that... They're a part of our life. It's a part of who we are. And to, and to come to the realization that the person that I have grown up to be was a result of a lot of lies and a lot of common natural sense that goes against God's reasoning. The Bible says God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are are higher than our thoughts. And therefore, who's going to change? <laughs> God doesn't change. His ways don't change. His values don't change. And so, how do we change? We change by conforming our thoughts to God's word and allowing his authority to rule our lives rather than all the collective reasoning of today. There's a lot of collective reasoning of the day that is, dia that is totally against God's thoughts and his ways. How many know what the word osmosis means? A lot of the things that we learn in life are because of osmosis. Here's the definition of osmosis. Learning by proxy or being exposed to someone can naturally achieve an unconscious assimilation of thoughts and ideas, knowledge, and even technical skills. It's called osmosis. Sometimes I'll be doing something around the house and my wife will say, where did you learn to do that? I don't know. I just learned it along the way somehow through observation. We learn so much by observation. And that's where we look at the life of Samson is that the things that he, the person that he has become is a result of the osmosis effect of his culture. And that has become a part of who he is and how he reasons and how he thinks and everything else. And so they became victims of a culture gone wrong. And this is the culture in which Samson and all of Israel was immersed into. In the past, here's another thing that's really interesting about this story. 
In the past, when Israel recognized their desperate situations, they cried out to God. There's no place in this story where the nation of Israel is crying out to God for deliverance. There's only two times that Samson cries out to God. One of the times is after he killed a bunch of Philistines and he was so thirsty. He says, God, I, you did all this for me and now I'm about ready to die. And so God actually makes water come out of a rock and gives him water to drink. The other time in Samson's life where he cried out to God is at the, at the final stage of his life where he's between the two pillars and he says, God, just let me have revenge. See, that's his motivation. It isn't, it isn't to do the will of God. It isn't to be identified with the, the purpose and the destiny that God had for him. It's to simply have revenge. And Brian Burkant talked about that last week, didn't he? And that's where his heart's at. That's where his motive is at, is to have revenge. And so God, in his sovereignty and in his will, makes it happen. And we'll talk about some of the reasons why God allowed some of that stuff. And so let's look at the birth of Solomon, or Samson. In Judges 13 and verse 1, again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord again, again, and again, and again, and again. You'd think they'd learn along the way, wouldn't you? Again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them. And, you know, this, this book is as much about the mercy of God as anything else, and the grace of God. How in spite of their sin, how many, how many realize God sought us when we were deep in our sin and rescued us and set our feet on solid rock? I can remember times in my life cursing God, even kicking the window of a church in one time because I was so mad at God. And yet, God never forsook me. He stayed with me. You know, we sing that song sometimes, I found Jesus. I got news for you. You did not find Jesus. He found you. He found you. He searched you out. And that's what God continually does in the life of the nation of Israel. He never gives up on them. And he raises up leaders from time to time, that will bring them back to their senses. And so again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. By the time we get to Samson's story in the book of Judges, it's been approximately 284 years since Joshua died. And during that 284 years, they have constantly been going from up to down, up to down, up to down. And so their culture is really immersed in all of the idols, in the worship of all of those idols. You know, it amazes me, a few weeks ago, we we're talking about Gideon and all that Gideon did. And you know what Gideon did at the end of his life? He took all those bracelets and all those jewelry and molded them into an idol after what God had already done for him. It's a sad story, folks. But there's a better story with Jesus, isn't there? Amen? And so it's been 284 years and the Israelites once again slipped into their evil ways. The nation of Israel was so compromised and embedded into the culture of the Philistines that they no longer recognized the ins and outs of God's word and his law. They had been doing whatever they wanted to do in their own way for so long. They no longer knew what it meant to walk in God's ways. Unfortunately, this is a culture that Samson 
was born into. And then God intervenes. In Judges 13, verses 2 through 7, Now there was a certain man from Zorah of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Indeed, now you are barren, and you have borne no children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Verse 4. Now therefore, please be careful not to drink wine or similar drink, and not to eat anything unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Verse 6. So the woman of God came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came to me, and his countenance was like the countenance of an angel of God. Very awesome. But I did not ask him where he was from, and he did not tell me his name. And he said to me, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. Now drink no wine or similar drink, nor eat anything unclean, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. And so Samson, as we see here, was to be a Nazarite and to live by the Nazarite vow throughout his life. For, for a lot of people, the Nazarite vow was for a certain season. But for Samson, it was for his life, all the days of his life. The Nazarite vow meant that one was to be a devoted or a consecrated person who was to be separated to God, including abstaining from fermented drink, refraining from cutting their hair, and avoiding contact with dead bodies. And then we get to Judges 14, and we begin to read about Samson's folly, the things that were really going to interfere with his life to a devastating effect. In verse 2, Samson went down to Timnah and saw a woman. You know, it's interesting. Timnah was, it was a Philistine city. And as you see, as the story goes, Samson was a regular there. He hung out with the Philistines. In fact, when he was ready to get married, all of his brides, uh, or groomsmen, were Philistines. He was disobeying the commandment not to fellowship with non-Israelites. And so Samson went down to Timnah and saw a woman. Timnah, in Timnah, the daughters of the Philistines. And so he went up and told his father and mother, saying, I have seen a woman. He hadn't talked to her yet. He had just seen her. He just looked upon her. I have seen a woman. Of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, you go and get her for me. You see, the parents in that day had to make a deal with the bride's parents for the marriage to happen. And so here's Samson's response to his parents. Then his father and mother said to him, is there no woman among the daughters of, the bre of your brethren or among all my people that you must go and get a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? And then Samson said to his father, get her for me, for she pleases me well. Samson has no respect or honor towards his parents, which shows his ignorance towards the commands given to the law of Moses. He then orders his mother and father to go get her as a wife for him. His mother and father's response to him is very interesting. In the fact that it was actually unlawful and forbidden by the Mosaic law to intermarry with non-Israelites. And they don't even mention that to him as part of their reasoning. That shows how far even his parents and the people of that day had strayed 
from the law of Moses and had accepted the culture of the day, had accepted what was happening in their culture in that day. And here's the thing that troubles me. As I look to our culture today, we have strayed so far, so far. And it isn't just in the worldly culture. It's in the church culture as well. We have strayed from the reality of God's word. We have strayed from all that the Bible teaches. You know, the Bible says in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given to us, is God breathed, and given to us for instruction in righteousness, that we may be thoroughly equipped for what God has for each and every one of us. See, they had strayed so far that they no longer had any kind of a mentality to what God's purpose was in that day. They had settled into a place of complacency and acceptance that the Philistines ruled over them. Well, that's just the way it is, Samson. They rule over us. He then orders his mother and father to go get her as a wife for him. His mother and father's response is what I just told you. And this is just one example of the culture that had drifted so far from God's law, they didn't even try to use it in their reasoning with him. Their senses were so compromised and so deadened to the conviction of the law of Moses, they had drifted too far. I wonder how far, how much our conscience has been deadened to the word of God. You know, today in Christianity, a lot of people are totally illiterate when it comes to God's word. It's the truth. They don't know it. And so part of our job here as ministers is to make sure that we are steeped in God's word. I remember when I was a young Bible school student, and, you know, they would raise us up and send us out on te church planning teams. And I remember one of my Bible teachers said, th this was his th um, philosophy at the time. What we do, this is during the hippie movement and, and the Jesus freak movement and all of that. And he says, what we do is we just pump the word of God into them. We pump the word of God into them. We pump the word of God into them. And then we send them out. <laughs> and that's not happening today. It's really not happening today. And I think we need to make it happen. And so let's keep in mind their failures are lessons that we need to take to heart. The book of Hebrews gives us great exhortation on how to avoid drifting too far. It says in Hebrews 2.1, Therefore we must give the more earnest heed the more earnest, the word earnest is a long, hard meaning. It's a good word. That means we fervently press into it. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. They weren't giving <laughs> earnest heed to the commandments of Moses, to the laws of Moses, and they drifted so far that they could no longer recognize the word of God. Paul tells us clearly, clearly in 2 Corinthians that we are to have no fellowship with unbelievers. In chapter 6 and verse 14, it says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And so the question is, are we influencers or are we influencees? When I first got saved, well, when I came back to the Lord, I was still an influencee. I had no business being with unsaved people. 
There comes a time when we get liberty. We become more of an influencer and God can send us out into the world. But many times, a lot of Christians bite the dust because they weren't ready to be sent out into the world. They hadn't become an influencer yet. Jesus met with sinners. He was always the influencer. Not the in People say, well, Jesus met with sinners. Yeah, he did. He sat with them. He dined with them. But you know what? He influenced them. Let us not be fools. Let us be fools for Christ rather than being filled with the foolishness of the world. Our culture today is as much the same as it was in Samson's day. Everyone is pretty much doing what is right in their own eyes. And I would say in the church world, it's the same thing. I, I, it's not a blanket statement. I, I know there's pockets. I hope that we're one of those pockets where we realize, you know, we value God's word. This is an attitude, I want to read you, so I was reminded of the scripture this morning, so it's not really in my notes, but I have it here. It's found in Jeremiah chapter 5 and verse 30. This is Jeremiah speaking to the people in his day, but I believe it's also Jeremiah speaking to the people in our day. He says, an astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. The prophets, I, the prophets prophesy falsely and the priests rule by their own power. And here's the, here's the sad part. And my people love to have it so. But what will you do in the end? You know what's being released upon the church in the hour we live in? Preachers and teachers who will tell you what you want to hear. The Bible says in the last days, one of the predominant things that will be, it will be in the church is people desiring to hear with itching ears what they want to hear. And there's more than enough preachers and teachers throughout the land on the internet. <laughs> They're all over the place. Satan has released them and it's only going to get worse. And so how do we combat that? We fill our hearts with God's word on a daily basis. We live and breathe God's word. We don't just know it. We experience it. And that's what changes us. And that's what conforms us along with the spirit of God into the image of Christ. And that's what's going to cause us in these days to rise up as the anointed ones and be all that God has called us to be. I believe God is raising up a people, a multitude of people who know his ways, who know how to walk in the spirit, who know how to understand the word of God. Let me, tell you, let me just throw this in for free. There has to be a balance between the Word and the Spirit. Yes. If you're strictly a Word person without the Spirit, you will become a legalist. Yes. If you are strictly a person of the Spirit without the Word, you will be wildfire. Yes. And here's the other thing. The Word of God always takes preference over what the Spirit has to say in our lives. You know why? Because when God's, when the Holy Spirit begins to speak to us, it first enters our spirit and it's pure. But the problem is, it has to be filtered through our unsanctified minds and our emotions. And by the time it reaches our mouth, <laughs> it's distorted. And the only thing that can purify it is God's word that has been tested seven times as pure gold. 
And so I grew up with the mentality in our stream of churches that we always test the wind by the word. There's a lot of winds that throw through the body of Christ that create more um, destruction and havoc than they do in ministering God's truth. But can God still get through in that? He sure can. God doesn't need us to be perfect for his sovereignty to rule. And that's one of the things that we find out about Samson. God didn't need a perfect Samson. He could still do what he wanted to do. And that's why it's so important for us in this day and age to connect to the sovereignty of God. That we understand how our free will works with the sovereignty of God. And I'll give you a plug on one of my books. The one on, the one, I don't have that many of them, but the one on prophetic purposes, the whole thing's about where free will and sovereignty meet. God wants his sovereignty to meet with your free will. In Judges 14 and verse 4, it says, But his father and mother did not know that it was the Lord, that he was seeking an occasion to move against the Philistines. For at that time the Philistines had dominion over Israel. The fact that God sought to use this as an occasion to move against the Philistines does not mean that breaking the law was desired by God but that Samson's decision was overruled by God for his own sovereign purposes and glory. Throughout the story of Samson, we never get the idea that he had a heart towards God or carrying out God's purposes. I mentioned the two times where he did cry out. Samson's exploits were all wrought out of his crooked ways of thinking that were self motivating. However, God would use Samson's exploits for his purposes despite Samson's self-motivated attitudes. And so Samson was never connected to the sovereign purposes of God like Moses, Joshua, and the other patriarchs were. The same thing is true in our day as Paul brings this to our attention in the book of Philippians. In Philippians chapter 1 and verse 15, it says, Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my chains. And so let me ask you this. Do, all, do people still get ministered to when false motives are involved? Absolutely. Does God get the glory? Absolutely. What then, he says in verse 18, only in that every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and in this I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. So getting back to Samson, the next part of the story we find Samson taking his parents down to Timnah to arrange the wedding. He's forced them into doing that. In verse 5, so Samson went down to Timnah with his father and mother and came to the vineyard of Timnah. Now to his surprise, a young lion came roaring against him. And the Spirit of the Lord came mildly upon him, and he tore the lion apart as one would have torn apart a young goat, though he had nothing in his hand. By the way, if, if you missed um, uh, the, the video last week by Carrie and his wife, you should go watch that. It was an amazing video. <laughs> but he did not tell his father and mother what he had done. Then he went down and finally talked with the woman, and she pleased him well. The fact that he did not tell his father and mother about this implies that they had already gone ahead of him to complete the wedding arrangement. And so Samson finally shows up once the arrangement has been made and gets to finally meet her for the first time after initially liking her to the point of forcing his parents to make the arrangement. 
And so this marriage arises out of and reflects Israel's willingness to coexist peacefully with the Philistines. Is that what's happening today in Christian culture? We're trying to coexist peacefully with the world. We don't want to ruffle their feathers. We don't want to get them all riled up. (laughs) And so we compromise. And we end up taking on their values. Or their values are not even a concern to us anymore. That's just the way it is. I mean, things are changing so rapidly today. We need to be on guard. And guess what? Your children are being raised in those values. It's being force-fed to them. And you as parents need to combat that by training up your children in the ways of the Lord. Helping them to understand the difference between the culture of the world and the culture of the church. As one theologian said, this action he, of this action, he says, with brilliant irony, he describes a free spirit, a rebel driven by selfish interests, interests, doing whatever he pleases without any respect for his parents and with no respect for the claims of God on his life. But in the process, he ends up doing the will of God. That's God. God's going to do what he wants to do. He'll bypass whatever's going on in our lives and he'll get it done. And so in order to cut to the chase, let's, we, find, we then find Samson on his way back coming in contact with a dead carcass. That was against his Nazarite vow. I wonder what he was doing when he was hanging out with all those Philistines. Were they his drinking buddies? I mean, if he could, if he, if he, if he could you know, violate his vow this easy, easily, how much more was it, you know, when he's hanging out with all of his buddies? So he had no regards to his Nazarite vow, and that even is proved more so when he finally gives in to what Delilah's requests were. And so with this in mind, Samson foolishly uses this little episode to pose a riddle to all the Philistine companions. They're his companions who were to be a part of the wedding party that his father had put into play. In verse 14, chapter 14, he said to them, out of the eater came something to eat, and out of the strong came something sweet. You know, I was thinking about this the other day. We were all up in Bonita watching um, bee people take the honey out of the wall and how meticulously they were doing it and and then putting the honey into jars. Can you imagine Solomon? I'm trying to think about this, and Solomon reaching into that carcass and getting a handful of honey and then wanting to take some of it home to his parents. How how did he avoid getting all sticky and messy and everything else? He didn't have little pint jars to put it in like you guys did the other night. (laughs) And then it says, well, and as a result, Samson loses his bet with his companions. He then uses his power to kill. Again, he's using his power to do what? To pay off a debt, a gambling debt. He uses God's power to pay off a gambling debt. Now, is that crooked or is that crooked? Is that an abuse of God's power or is that an abuse of God's power? Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. (laughs) God, you are amazing. (laughs) In spite of all this, your Spirit's going to come upon him in a mighty way. And he went down to Ashkelon and killed 30 of their men, took their apparel, and gave them the changes of the clothing to those who had explained the riddle. So his anger was aroused and he went back up to his father's house and Samson's wife was given to his companion who had been his best man. And so as the story continues, Samson is once again foolishly using his power to avenge the Philistines 
for giving his wife to another man. The finality of Samson's foolishness comes when he takes up with a harlot from Gaza and then a woman from the valley of Sorek whose name was Deliah. The Philistines wanting to get even with him have Deliah, Delilah trick him into giving up where his great strength lies. You would think after the first couple times he'd get the idea that this isn't working, <laughs> that something's going to go wrong. But he doesn't. He's deceived. And that's what happens when we start getting into the, giving in to the devil's ways. When we start giving in to the lies of the culture, we gradually get deceived until we no longer believe the truth. And so after many failed attempts by the Philistines, Samson finally tells, us, tells her where his strength comes from. In the end, they capture Samson cut his eyes out and put him in prison to be a grinder. In the end, we see where God in his sovereignty has his way. The lords of the Philistines call for Samson to perform for them. Samson ends up killing more Philistines in his death than he had killed in his life. God's paving the way for the next generation. And so what are the lessons we learn from Samson? What are we to take heed to so that we're not compromised and slip away? Number one, make sure we are not ingrained in the culture of the world, but we are ingrained in God's culture. Make sure you understand what God's culture looks like. And the only way you're going to know that, you know, you can get it bit by bit preaching on Sundays, but that's not going to work because you forget by Monday. So sometimes somebody asks me, what did they speak about last week? And I have to, well, let's see. <laughs> we lose it so fast, don't we? We have to remind ourselves daily, daily, what God's word says. Romans 12 says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God. And so are we today, in this church, are we providing a culture or a kingdom culture that will enable people's minds to be renewed? And that's where our heart is as leaders. We want to provide for you that kind of a culture. We're still in the midst of putting it all together, but that's where we're going. We want a kingdom culture in this church. We want God's word to rule in this church. We want his spirit to set us at liberty to do what he's called us to do. As leaders, that's what we want. And just as Samson was a victim of his culture, we have people coming into our church environment every week who have been wounded, bruised, and victimized by the worldly culture. It's our responsibility to provide them an environment for their minds to be renewed by God's word rather than the ideas and the philosophies of human reasoning or the watering down of God's word, the compromising of his word. Paul the apostle says, I never failed to preach the whole gospel. He preached the whole gospel. He preached the good, the bad, and the ugly. He preached the goodness. He preached the severity. He preached it all. You know, in today's church world, we understand the goodness of God. It's been grained into us. We understand that, but we don't understand the severity of God. We don't understand that. It is not preached in today's church world. It is ignored. It has to be preached, I'm telling you this now, it has to be a part of our culture. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. You want wisdom? You gotta fear God. You gotta understand what that means. It's not just an awesome respect. It is all of that, but it's more. One of the things that led me to finally turn my life over to Christ was I, I grew up 
hearing hellfire and brimstone messages. And I was deathly afraid of hell. You know what's happening in today's church culture? Hell is being minimized. It's being minimized. Hell is still a burning flame of fire. And it will always be. And it will be where you will be if you do not accept Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life. It's more than just accepting him as Savior. He says, confess me as Lord. Confess me as ruler. And I will be your Savior. Come out from among them and I will receive you as a father and you will be my sons and daughters. Amen? Amen. That's the word of God to us in this hour. And we've got to get it, folks, or worldliness will creep in. And the culture of this church will change. You know, I'm a wedding officiant. That's my business. I meet Christians all the time. They want to get married who are already living together in sin. They, they have adopted the culture of the world that says, let's get our ducks in a row and then we'll get married. That's got to change. It's still a sin to fornicate. It never changes. There's a lot of sins that we allow by not addressing them. I know I just offended some people, but <laughs> I'd rather offend you than offend God. That means every one of us taking on responsibility to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, by God's word so that we can provide an osmosis effect of those coming into the church to be renewed. Again, if we're all coming into the stature of the fullness of Christ and we're walking in that, you know, people take on the level of maturity where the body is at. They just adjust to it. It's called osmosis. And we want to raise that level of osmosis. Amen? We want to raise that level of osmosis so that people's lives can be really changed. And their minds can be renewed by the Word of God and the Spirit of God. You know, there's a lot of liberties that we have and some of those liberties, you know, they're all right. But don't take your liberty and broadcast it all over the web, all over Facebook. The Bible says in Romans 14, 23, all things are lawful to me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify or build up. Let no one seek his own, but each other's well-being. Then verse 22 sums it up. So whatever you believe about these things, keep to yourself and God. Blessed is the one who does not condemn himself by what it proves. I, I remember years ago, I like the Beatles. I grew up with the Beatles. Anyway, my son had some friends over. Something was going on. They were having an overnight party. And I was playing one of the Beatles songs. And this young guy says to me, how come you're playing doper music? <laughs> and I realized right then that my liberty was possibly offending him. <laughs> and so... I keep to myself what my personal liberties are between me and God. And that's the way we all should be. I see too much on Facebook. You know, just, oh, look, all the liberty I have. I can be a Christian and do this, and it's wonderful. Anyway, enough said. <laughs> you got the point. We need to ask ourselves, are we more bent on doing our own thing and what seems right to us, or are we more concerned about the well-being of others? The second lesson, I've already talked about that, so don't, 
we, we separate ourselves from all that's ungodly. I already said all this. Thirdly, be a good steward of your gifts and talents. Samson, and I'm about ready to end here. Samson used his unique gifting from God foolishly for his own purposes and revenge, even though God, through his sovereignty, allowed it to happen. 1 Peter 4.10 says, For each of you has received a gift. Minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold of grace. As Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he said, And there are diversities of activities, but it's the same God who works all in all, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. And so let's be good stewards of the gifts. First of all, in order to be a good steward of the gift, you have to develop the gift. Amen? You have a gift. The Bible says we all have gifts. We've all been given something from God. And we need to, we need to um, discover what that gift is, practice it. <laughs> so we need to increase. We need to grow into the stature of the fullness of Jesus Christ. And so the motives of our heart, the wrong motives will only produce wood, hay, and stubble, of which Paul warns us that those will be burned even though we will be saved. But I'm not sure what that means, being saved by fire. But I'll tell you this, I do know, I never want to find out what that means. And so make sure we're all serving God Growing in God, not being a fool like Samson, but being foolish for Christ. Amen. God bless you. May the Lord's peace be upon you.